afternoon and happy Sabbath church. I'm acutely aware of the time, so I'm just going to get into it. I'm happy to be here. You should know that. Um, it's always good to be back at your first, the first family, I call it, first family home church, so I'm glad to be here. Before we begin, let's say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us, and I pray that you will speak through me, speak to us today, that we'll be able to know you better, to serve you with our whole hearts, and to love you each day is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The title for today's sermon is Burden Bearer. Burden Bearer. And what does this mean? You know, uh, those of you that are, how many of you are in school right now? What is the one item you have to take with you each and every day before you leave? Say it out loud. It's okay. You can talk to me. Backpack, right? Uh, a backpack. And later on, you get some more sophisticated. You get a a little sling or something like that, a briefcase. But you get a backpack, you know? And it's one of those exciting things. I remember as, as a small boy, you see Anna and Akka, they have their backpacks and they're going to school. And, you know, before you go to school, you always want to go to school. And after you go to school, you never want to go to school again. <laughs> and you get that idea of, oh, I want to get a backpack. And you have this big old backpack that you want to get, you know, little guy. You get this big backpack and all you have in it is a few colored pencils. You know? There's nothing in it, and you carry it, you make sure you have your books, maybe a book, a pencil, it may be a book that has nothing to do with school, but one you want to take to school, you know, when you were young, and then even your lunch can fit inside, but you know, as you become older, you start to look a little like this, some of you in middle school, that's you every day. Uh, and, and look at the labored face, you know, he's got his trumpet in one hand because he's got to go to band, he probably has practice for something and later on, and his book's on his back. Can you imagine the burden upon this young man's shoulders? You see, the books start getting heavier and more plentiful, and then eventually, your book bag's not heavy, big enough, so what do you get? A locker. You have more places to store more burdens. <laughs> Uh, the burden of, the, of your math class and algebra and geometry, you got to put it away because you, your shoulders can't carry anymore. And you have some of these kids that just, they try to carry everything in their backpack. You know, they're walking around like this. Too much for small, young, weak shoulders to carry. And as we get older, we start adding more and more burden to our backpack. You see, the book bag is not large enough and our shoulder, shoulders are not strong enough to carry all that there is to carry. The burden is too large and my strength is too small. And that is what carrying our sin is like. Many of us who don't know the Lord, we're constantly having to carry our sin on our back. And everything seems fine, it seems okay, and you sometimes can get so used to carrying your sin that you don't realize it's actually weighing you down. For some reason, you're not able to move as swiftly as the other person can. You're not able to bend and pick something up. You have to kind of be careful because you don't want anything to fall out and it's all just hurting your shoulders. Can you imagine trying to sleep with this on? But many people do, because they're carrying the burden of their own sin. The guilt and shame of sin is so great that we cannot carry it, but we try. Our shoulders hurt, our feet become tired, and our heart becomes weary, because the burden is too much. It's too much. And many people, we simply just want to give up. We are not at peace. We find it difficult to fall asleep because we cannot find joy with the burden of sin on our backs. No matter whether you're a believer or not, you'll know what I'm talking about. Because have you ever felt this way? That even if you didn't know because of the law that was written upon your heart, even though you didn't see it in the Bible, being dishonest to someone without their knowledge, and for some reason, you just can't stop thinking about being dishonest. You got what you want, but something just doesn't feel right inside. 
You stole from someone else and they did not know what you spoke badly about someone and they're trying to find out who it was and they're looking at you and you're acting like you didn't do anything. The repeated, repeated selfish actions that we do are burdens on our back. And then there is the sin of denying God our creator through our actions, of disobeying his commands. All this guilt and shame is too much for you and I to bear. So my friends, let me tell you, the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 53, surely he has, what? Born our griefs. And he has carried our sorrows. That word for griefs is also sickness, our disease. He has taken the disease upon himself. And then he's carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him or judged him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. That word transgressions, is, it, it, it means like rebellion. He was wounded for your, yours and my rebellion. He was bruised or crushed. For our iniquities. And that word iniquities is, is the depravity or the guilt of our depravity. The chastisement, the punishment for our, uh, of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, who is healed? We are healed. And then it ends here and says, The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He carries our griefs and sorrows. He carries our iniquity, which is our guilt of sin. Even verse 11 in chapter 53 of Isaiah, he says, He shall bear their iniquities. He shall bear your iniquities. Can you imagine why so many people are so upset and angry with one another? It's because they're walking around with this thing on their back and they don't know how to get rid of it. But let me tell you, the truth will set you free. <laughs> People are so upset and angry with one another because they're carrying around this burden and they're so angry because they haven't slept right, because they haven't, uh, they, they've blamed themselves, they haven't come to the foot of the cross, they haven't come to the throne of grace where they may obtain mercy. And find a God, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2, verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body, on the tree that we having died to sins might now do what live for righteousness you see when you come to Christ you actually get to live because the sin <laughs> it bears you down it makes everything hurt it makes everything seem wrong my friends Christ carries he is the burden bearer. He carries the burden of our guilt and shame when we come to him. And he carried your sins to the cross so that you could be counted as righteous if you would trust him. The weight of sin was removed from your shoulders. I can now take it off. And he takes it away. You should imagine, do that yourself. Imagine that being the burden of sin and carry it around for a day and see how it feels. And when you take it off, at first it doesn't feel like much. But if you keep that on your back for an hour, I just did it for 10 minutes. And when I took it off, what did I do? Whew. There's relief. There's a peace. There's a strength that all of a sudden gets, that comes back. I know in sports, you get your second wind. You eventually get to feel that way. Yes, true Christianity is the only religion where you do not get what you deserve. Love, grace, and mercy are freely given to those who would believe in Jesus. Jesus carries away my guilt and shame so that I do not need to carry it. He clears my debt, not because of my goodness, but because of his goodness. You see, other religions tell you to work to change the outcome of your final destination. They say the only way to be saved is to work to gain God's or the God's approval. In Hinduism, you may pay alms. You may make a pilgrimage barefoot to a sacred place in order to earn the God's favor, to let the gods know that you are worthy. You may cut yourself or pierce yourself in order to show yourself worthy of their approval. Buddhism tells us to think 
Just think and focus on yourself until you have the burdens fall off once you reach enlightenment. Other religions say just do more good than bad and maybe you'll be saved. You do something so that God will think differently about you. But in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, Even while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. I did not need to change God's opinion about me for him to give himself up for me. But God, out of his great love, chose to bear the burden voluntarily. Satan may say, God does not love you because you are wicked. But God can point to the cross and say, my child, see the evidence of my love. In Christianity, God acts, God moves, that we may change our opinion about him. That we may taste and see that he is good, that he is love. My friends, you are made righteous through Christ's righteousness. Not by your own. That's why this thing can come off. He takes it. And now I become righteous because he is righteous. That's what Romans chapter 5, verse 19, I don't have it here. It says, Romans 5, verse 19 says, By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Micah 7, verse 19 says, He will again have compassion on us and will subdue. That literally means to trample underfoot our iniquities. He will hurl your sin into the depths of the sea. My friends, Jesus has carried away the burden of your sin. You do not need to carry it. Stop being so angry and upset. It's taken. Live free of that burden. That is the foundation of the hope. It's different than every other idea in religion. Cherish this hope. Believe. I know some of you are getting uncomfortable thinking, wait, wait, are you saying I take sin seriously? I'm talking about the burden that Jesus died for. The forgiveness that comes that I don't need to keep walking around with this. Have you ever been hangry in your life? Yes, you have. You might be hangry right now because it's 1245. Now think about living with that hangriness instead of being hungry for food. You're just hungry because this has just been upsetting you. Your mind and your stomach and your heart just aren't at peace. It's that burden of sin. And now you're walking around with it for 50 years of your life. You know how angry you're going to be? You know how irritated and sleepless you're going to be? When Jesus says, I will take it from you. How many verses in the Bible have to tell us about him carrying the burden of our sin. Isaiah 53. I'm not saying, don't worry about sin. It's not going to be around you. Of course not. That's not what I'm saying at all. But the burden, the, the, the death that sin brings, when Jesus comes into my life, he brings life. So I don't need to worry about this. Burden. Not the sins around, all right? So be, be, I'm, I want you to be clear. I'm not saying, you know, just do anything you want to do. You know, you've heard me preach before, so I don't need to tell you what I'm thinking when I'm saying it. Let him carry that burden. He had already taken it. He is a God that lives for us to be with him forever. We're not going to walk in there into the heavenly gates with the sin on our backs. If we still have it on our backs, that means we have not accepted his substitutionary death. Are you with me? We're <laughs> walking without this. But once you do, so many of us Christians, we end there. We're so grateful. Oh, I wish you know the gospel. He has set me free from my addiction. He's broken every chain. And we're telling people about it, but we are no good to anybody. We have said, he is my burden bearer, but I don't want any of your burdens. You see, we can't bear the burden of people's sin, but we can surely share in the burden of their pain, their hurt, their discouragement. As you go through life, you have to think about how God has not made us a selfish creation. All creation works in harmony with one another. It receives in order to give back. It was never meant to receive in order to keep it to itself. God did not make a selfish creation. All of nature works in this way. God made it so that when we breathe out, 
carbon dioxide, it is taken in by the plants. The plants then give back what we need to breathe in, oxygen. This is the design of life by God. Think of how there is food in the world. Plants grow because of the soil, the rain, and the sun it receives. Thank you, rain, sun, and soil. Then the plants don't just keep it all to themselves. They then grow and provide food to the animals, to us. Those animals eat the plants and then release waste. They then use the, the plants then use the waste to receive carbon into the soil again and grow back even stronger. Are you with me? Through this process created by God, life is sustained. What if plants received sun and rain but never provided food? It simply kept all the sun and rain to itself, and you and I would not survive in this world. After receiving the rain of mercy and the love of Jesus, are you giving what you have received to another? Or are you only taking and never giving back? If plants did this, it would cause all of us to be hangry for the rest of our lives and eventually die hangry. The effect is the same when we do this to each other. It brings pain, suffering, and death. So we should have three responses to what God has done for us. He has forgiven you. We talked about that. He has encouraged us. He has provided for our needs. Our response should be that we do those same things for others. There's a song that song Matthew West wrote, he says, um, so I shook my fist at heaven, looking at all the pain and suffering happening in the world, and says, why don't you do something? And he says, and then God says, I did. I made you. I want to end off today just talking about those three things that we can do, that we were made to do, because when we do not do them, we will be cut off Luke chapter 3, verse 9 to 11, Jesus talks about plants that do not bear fruit are cut down. What is the fruit that you are giving? And I'll just name three because uh, they're the fruit, that they're the things that God has done for us. Oh, we're doing good. Number one, forgive. Matthew 6, verse 14 to 15 says, If you forgive, God will forgive. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their trespasses, what happens? Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Are you with me? You see, he takes the burden of guilt, the sin that's come off our shoulder. But sometimes, if we live life in a way that's only taking and not giving, we voluntarily choose to put the burden back on our shoulder. Are you with me? It's not a once and for all done deal for this. Because what we can do is we come to know Christ. He's taken the burden off our back. And he's like, now you should do that for others. But what we do is we put burdens on other people's backs again. We are the reason for their burden. And Christ says, here, look, if you don't forgive, I can't forgive you. Are you with me? If I don't have the forgiveness of my sins, who now is carrying the sin. Me. You're wondering why, you know, you were freed from something and now, you know, you started doing some church work and doing all those other things and all of a sudden, the peace is gone. It might be because you haven't forgiven somebody. You're now having to bear your trespass on your own. Are you with me? Because we were not made selfish creations. If we receive God's forgiveness, He expects, He demands that we give that forgiveness to someone else. Are you with me? You have to work this way. This is the way God is. If you believe you are forgiven by God, if it is actually true, that means, it literally means, it equals, you have forgiven those who have trespassed against you. Have you? Or can you sit here today saying you have forgiven the person who has sinned against you. And if you have not, then you may not actually have God's forgiveness. Oof. Is there someone who has wronged you? Do not wait another day to forgive that person. Forgiveness does not mean you are both now best friends. It simply means you are clearing the debt. You are no longer living as if that person owes you something. That's why the Lord says in, in the prayer, 
Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. What you will find is that once you clear someone else's debt, when you forgive them, the burden of your anger and hatred will be removed from your shoulders. You see, if you keep carrying it, for me right now, for five minutes, it's not a big deal, but the moment I keep carrying it, anger turns into bitterness. Is this what happens? And now you're so bitter that you've gotten used to your bitterness. And now you're just a bitter person to everyone you meet. And it had nothing to do with the person who has wronged you. It has everything to do with the fact that you did not forgive. It, didn't, it doesn't mean now you're all going to Panda Express to hang out to have a, have a meal together. It just means that you've cleared the debt. You know that person when they walk in is like, all right, pay up. It's not happening anymore. Clear the debt, my friends. Find the burden taken off. Because when you do not forgive, it is a burden you are carrying. That person may not even know. They may not even care. The only way to remove that burden is to forgive so that the hatred and the bitterness will dissipate. It may not happen overnight, but it will happen over time. That is how God created us. We receive forgiveness as we forgive others. God forgives me. I forgive others. Once this give and receive cycle is broken, that is why we have broken homes, broken families, and broken relationships. That is why there is so much hatred and anger and revenge wanting, be, wanting to be taken in this world. And God says the simple thing is to forgive and remove that burden. Number two, encourage one another. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11, so encourage each other and build each other up. That word for build is literally the one that they use for building a building, like erecting a building. That, that's, what it's, that's what it is. Can you imagine that you have the ability to build up a seer's tower in somebody? Uh, James tells us, I think it's chapter 3, it might be 4, he talks about the fact that the tongue is like a rudder on a huge ship. And it can steer a huge ship, just this little rudder, to go left or right and to keep it on track. And your tongue has that same ability. It can either tear down or it can build up. It can break a home or it can build a home. What are you using your tongue for? <laughs> are you a person who encourages or discourages others? Are you a person who only comes to church in order to complain or to lift others up? The Bible tells us that we must build each other up. The tongue is powerful. He has entrusted you, God, with the choice to use your tongue for good. Is that what you are doing? After you've learned to forgive, you must not stop there. No matter who you are, you have a very powerful weapon within your grasp, your tongue. When someone is discouraged, I encourage you to use your words to encourage them and lift them up. Your words have that ability. When someone does something kind for you, use your words to show your gratitude for it. The Bible tells us that the Lord healed a bunch of healed ten lepers, and how many came back? One. Let's be like that one. Show your gratitude. I've seen some people, they've been helped by someone else. Uh, they came from a different country. They got help uh, to get their papers right, and uh, they now have a job. And now when someone else needs help from another country, it's like, oh, no, I don't. Why? you gotta, you got to do your own thing. Did you forget that you were literally helped by like five or ten people to make it in this country? And now when someone else is trying to find help, you act as if you've lived here your entire life. <laughs> I know you've either been that person or you know a person like that. It, it's so weird that we become like that. And God says, look, use your words, use your ability to help. Be able to show gratitude to the person that has helped you, that has been there for you. That could be your wife, your spouse, your husband, children, your parents. Even when things are normal, use your words to encourage a young child, a new parent, a new pastor. I know a lot of times I've seen churches, a new pastor comes and all they got is critiques, Let's not call it critiques. Discouragement. 
Oh, he, 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 he didn't do this, or she didn't do that, or they only use one Ellen White quote in the whole sermon. Like, everything is a complaint. I'd encourage you to watch your words. The Bible says kind words are healthy for the body. Proverbs 16, verse 24 says, Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, health to the bones. Another version says, Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul, and healthy for the body. The health message is more than food sometimes. It's words. You can bring health to someone's body by your words. Amen. Uh, I find it so interesting that people in the world today, they're so grateful that someone, for some reason, oh, he speaks his mind. I like that political leader because he tells it like it is. Literally, we tell children, don't say that. Watch your words. And now all of a sudden, we're encouraged when adults don't watch their words. It makes absolutely no sense to me. A Christian is it, it, one of the greatest abilities God has given to us is self-control. To be able to bring under our control our passions, our abilities, our words, our hands, our actions. It is the immature Christian that says, oh, I just do whatever I feel like. But no. If your words are going to hurt, if they're to bully, shut your mouth. You may want to say it, but the mature Christian is able to say, no, I shouldn't say that. The mature Christian doesn't say, oh, yeah, I just blabber and I yell and I scream. And no, that's, that's what children do. Are you with me? It's so weird that now we have access to Twitter. Like, I need everyone to know what I'm thinking and how I'm thinking. No, you don't. We do not need to hear what you have to say. Sometimes it's better for you to just shut your mouth. Or I should say, close your fingers. So many people have had to go on Twitter and then been like, oh, I probably shouldn't have said that. It's literally what this is saying. James is telling us, if, watch your tongue, watch your fingers now. Use your words, my friends, to encourage. You want good days ahead of you? Don't speak evil of others or lie about others. Gossip should not be a part of a Christian's life. If you are one who is practicing this, I encourage you to change your path. See that God has entrusted you to use your tongue to speak that which will build and not break down. Finally, I, as we've seen God being our burden bearer, help each other. Help each other. And this, is where, this is our last uh, portion of our sermon here. Isaiah 58, verses 6 and 7. I don't have it on the screen, so you're going to have to go there with me. As we look at Isaiah 58, and this is where we'll end for today. Isaiah 58, the Lord has some things to say to his people because uh, they're wondering, Lord, why don't you hear us? Like, what's going on? We, we're fasting, and we've afflicted our souls, and you're not noticing all of the stuff that we're doing. And the Lord then says, um, oops, the Lord then says in verse 6, Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own family, from your own flesh and blood. The Bible says we must help one another. You see, all of us, no matter who we are, for the rest of our lives will be carrying some burden. Until we get to heaven, there's a burden to carry, the burden of pain, the burden of disappointment, the burden of discouragement. There's something there. But there are those people that will then come along, reach into your backpack. Have you ever tried to get something out of your backpack without taking it off? You know how difficult that is? You, you, you look very foolish because you'll be like this, and then you, you thought your water was on this side, so you reach, and it's not there. You reach here, and you try to, and then you can't. I do this all the time. Then I got to do this thing, swing it around. But what if it was on your back and someone comes to help you and they say, you know what? I'm going to remove the book, help remove the book of your disappointments out of your life. Words of disappointment that you've been hearing your whole life. Just to encourage them to tell them that you're willing to take some time for them and to hear them out. You may not be a pastor or a preacher. You may not be an evangelist. But you just may be a decent human being. And you have that ability. And the pack becomes lighter. 
A person may not have food and you're able to provide them a little bit of food. They've been going along with the book of hunger and thirst and they haven't been fulfilled and, and you're able to take that book out. The ones, the pages they've written for so many years that have just told them they'll never make it. But because of that little meal you provided, they've now been able to be encouraged to do something. And, and the pack starts getting lighter and lighter as we help each other. And all of a sudden, my bag that was so heavy is no longer as heavy as it was before. I can move a little easily, a little more easily. You know what I can do now? I have the ability to now go help someone else take out some burdens from their pack. Are, are you with me? There's going to be times when you're not going to be able to do that. Your bag, your burden is so heavy. There's so much going on. It could be taking care of a loved one, a sickness, a disease that's overtaking you. So you're not at the point right now where you can help. That's okay. All right? Know your boundaries at times. But when you start to get the ability to, and someone has encouraged you, they came to see you in the hospital, they came to pray for you, and now things are getting a little better. The whole idea of the divine life is one in which is like God, where he gives life that we may also give it to someone else. So now you just start removing some things, helping someone remove that disappointment from their life. Are you with me? And our packs start getting lighter, and all of a sudden we're nicer to each other, we're smiling a little more, our backs don't hurt as much, our knees are still a little there, but you know, it's getting better. All of a sudden we start treating each other with more respect and dignity and love, and things just are better when we abide by God's economy. The one in which it says, I receive only that I may give. The world's economy is, I receive so that I may keep. And you know what happens? The burden gets heavier and heavier. So I pray that you will help one another. We do not attend church every Sabbath. Uh, true Christians do not only attend church every Sabbath or read their Bible every night or fast every month. A true Christian recognizes the blessing God has provided to them and in response seeks to bless others as best they can. Is there someone hungry around you? Share some food. Is someone struggling under the weight of difficulties? You have the ability. Won't you help them with their burdens? Some of us have been helped so much by others in our life that we're doing much better than we were 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But now when we see others needing help, we do not give the help we received ourselves. This must change. And as we do, the joy in the church will change and the community will change. Then only will our community see God's hands working through your hands and your feet. Because look what the Bible says in Isaiah 58, verse 8. I have it up there. Isaiah 58 says, after you've taken care of those around you, you've undone the heavy burdens, you have loosed the bonds of wickedness. It says in verse 8 in Isaiah 58, then your light shall break forth like the morning. You were feeling that darkness. It wasn't because you had to focus on yourself. It's because God was saying, I need you to help someone else. And when you did that, now your light will break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. The Bible, I mean, not about Napoleon Hill, quote says, the man who always takes and never gives is not a leader. He is a parasite. Don't be a parasite. People don't like to be around people who are parasites. I'll share one last story here. As we seek to help one another, my, um, oh, let me go to the next slide. Uh, I went on a hiking trip a long time ago uh, when I was young. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, it feels like oh, it was like 15 years ago. So we would uh, go hiking to this place in West Virginia, and we would hike about three miles with packs on our back. And it was about seven of us, and it had everything we needed. The place we were going had no bathrooms, there's no stoves, or nothing. Everything you needed had to be in your bags. And so as we, that's not really us, you know. Uh, but those are the packs that we had. The pack I had was about 70 pounds. And as we're, we're going up, we're going up the steep incline at one point. We each have our own stuff to carry along with stuff all of us need, like baked beans or stuff we need to cook, like bread. All of us have water. As we're going up this, this, uh, the side of this mountain, um, it, it, there's a trail. We're not rock climbing. All of a sudden, as we're going, we're all looking down, looking down, trying to go up, because trying to keep our balance. They have all this burden on our back, and all of a sudden, one of my friends falls down. 
he falls to his knees, not because the burden was too much, or it was because the burden was too much, but he passes out. For a brief moment, it was too strenuous. There was too much in his bag. He falls to the ground to his knees, and we, I mean, we're on an incline at this point. We, all, all, those of us that were behind just come up to him, and what is the first thing we do? Take the bag off his back. All right? We have to get the bag off his back because it's too much. His body couldn't take it anymore. We get it off his back, put it to the side, get him standing up, sitting down, giving him some Gatorade chews, get some electrolytes in his body. And then we say, hey, for the next five minutes, let's see how it goes. We'll carry your bag for you. It's not that he couldn't carry it. He couldn't carry it right now. Are you with me? As we're going through the journey of life, there's going to be times someone in front of you is going to fall down, and you have the capability, the ability to be able to take their pack for a moment so they can gain their strength back and come back stronger. You have that capability. I pray that you will do that. And in doing so, the Bible says, bear one another's burdens, and so what? Fulfill the law of Christ. The idea is you, you see the law of Christ and you're filling it up to the top. That's how you do it. Not by simply being a hermit in your own house, but by bearing the burden of someone else, sharing that burden. You cannot share the burden in their guilt of sin, but certainly the burdens that they carry in their lives. Are you with me? Today, I pray that this church will obey the law of Christ. Instead of only receiving the grace and mercy and love from God, that we will give grace and mercy and love to others. Today I pray that you will forgive one another, encourage one another, help one another, and in doing so, obeying the law of Christ, that his life may be lived within each one of us. Live out thy life within me. May that be our prayer. Amen. King of Kings, found on page 316. Yeah. 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 Ye
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our God. And we pr I pray that each person with the hearing of my voice, that you will live out your life within each one of us. And when we see you face to face, soon and very soon, we will meet the King. May we all be counted uh, as part of that group, Lord. We long for your soon return. And we pray until then that our lives will be ones that well represent you is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>